From the Missouri School of Journalism, welcome to Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. On today's show, the second of our two-part series on euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide. In part one, we talked about the rise of euthanasia in the Netherlands, the first country to formally legalize the practice back in 2002. Now, today we'll turn our attention closer to home. We're going to talk about physician-assisted suicide, or medical aid in dying, in Canada, which legalized the practice back in 2016. We'll also talk about the debate in the U.S., where six states and the District of Columbia have laws that allow terminally ill patients to choose a voluntary death. A number of other states, including New York, Maryland, and New Mexico, are considering such laws. Now, in a few minutes, we'll be joined by Diane Rehm. She, of course, is a familiar voice for millions of NPR listeners who heard the Diane Rehm show for decades before her retirement from the program in 2016. As many of her listeners know, she's also an advocate for medical aid in dying or physician-assisted suicide. Now, in addition, we'll hear from Maura McQueen, a leading Canadian Catholic ethicist who will share a different perspective. But first, we're going to bring in Catherine Porter. She's the Canada Bureau Chief for The New York Times and has followed this issue closely in Canada over the last several years. Catherine, welcome. Thanks for having me. Well, remind us, Canada passed a law uh, allowing physician-assisted suicide for the terminally ill in 2016. Uh, Just tell us what, what the law said and who it was aimed at. The law came into force because of Supreme Court decision. Uh, The government was forced to pass the law. There was huge debate in Canada around this, although um, a lot of public support for it. The law is a little different than uh, the laws both that that had already been passed in the United States, um, in various states and in um, various uh, small European countries, in that um, in Canada you need to be suffering intolerably from uh, irremedial disease or sickness, meaning that you won't get better. You need to be nearing, and you need to be nearing death um, in order to qualify for medical assistance in dying. Um, You have to be also an adult. So in the Netherlands, you can be a mature minor, um, but that's not the case in Canada. Um, and the other thing so about in the Netherlands, law, I think I think the rule is between 12 and 16 with the consent of a parent, you can be euthanized. Right. That's not the case in Canada. That's not the case. You have to be an adult, which is 18 or older here in Canada, um, which is uh, something that's been debated before and since. Um, also, you need to be able to give um, consent. Uh, and you have to be deemed to have capacity, which means that you understand the choice you're making, the doctor has to deem, or a nurse has to deem that you are uh, able to understand the consequences of this decision. Um, And then you must wait um, 10 days, and then you're examined again, or you talk to the physician or nurse again, and they have to deem you capable of making the decision. Now that's also- So, so, tw- so it sounds like twice, basically twice you have to say that you want to go through with this. You have to say it once and then you sign a form and there's a 10 day grace period um, in which you're supposed to be weighing the options and really thinking it through. Now, um, so uh, there's no such thing in Canada as advanced consent. So. If you are diagnosed, let's say, with Alzheimer's um, and there's no reason to think you're going to die like imminently, um, you can't sign this form and say, when I get to the point that I'm so demented, my quality of life is terrible, I want to die. There's no advanced uh, consent here, which is a, a point of contention. Um, for people in Canada. Some people believe, and not all, that there should be advanced consent. So you really, you know, need to be um, nearing death and able to consciously talk to your doctor, be able, or your nurse, talk about the reasons for doing this, um, and for them to deem that you are mentally, like, capable. Which, you know, sometimes when people get really ill, they're so jacked up on painkillers and the disease is riddling their mind and body that there's a lot of concern that they might have signed the form and wanted to do this, um, but they lose the capacity in the doctor or nurse's mind to make that decision. That's That seems like a really interesting and unanticipated outcome of the law. But I, I wanted to ask you about this really moving article that you wrote about the death of a man named John Shields, which took place, uh, sounds like not too long after Canada passed this law. Tell us a bit about him and his decision. So um, 
Uh, I think that generally the back, the context of this is when you have a law about death and dying like this, it changes the whole discussion around death as well as palliative care, you know. And Canada generally is a death phobic society like most of North America. People don't talk about this. And because you're choosing to die in advance, people started talking. And, and I started noticing in obits, too, that they would mention they're having, uh, they've chosen death. And there were people were starting to have living wakes, so a party before they die. So if you know when you're going to die, um, then you might choose to have a party beforehand, like the night before. So I, I set out to try and find someone who was doing this. And I ended up meeting this remarkable man named John Shields, who was actually American. Um, by birth. He had been a Catholic priest, had left the priesthood, had also been the head of the largest union in British Columbia, which is a big province on the west coast of Canada, um, had been a highly spiritual man who was dabbling in different kinds of um, uh, consciousnesses, really. Uh, and he had a rare disease called amyloidosis, um, which, had, uh, which was going to kill him and uh, had really curtailed his life. He had no feeling in his hands or legs anymore. He was in unbearable pain, and he had chosen to have a medical assisted assisted death. Um, uh, this, you know, this was really difficult for his family, um, although they supported him. But it was difficult because I think there's something that's um, th this type of death provides a lot of people who are terminally ill and much pain with a curative feeling, like that they feel like a sense of relief that they're not going to be struggling in such kind of pain for a long time, that they feel a sense of control at the end of their life. Um, but for the family to have a death date is really, really difficult. And so he let me travel, he and his family let me travel along this end of his life journey with him um, to experience the, the wake that he had the day before he was dying, the night before he was dying. People assembled in his hospice at that point. They had a party for him with his favorite meal, with beer and wine and cake. And they all toasted him and, and said goodbye in a most beautiful way. And then um, the, the day of his death, um, he allowed me to come in and witness this death, which in some ways was um, a choreographed death. He had a, a death doula there who helped create a, a, a ritual around his death, um, which was very beautiful. And um, as beautiful, I suppose, as a death could be, he was really at peace with his, his dying. And as difficult as it was, I think, for his family to accept that there was a date to it, they, they gave him a beautiful send out. Well, our time grows short, Catherine, but I wanted to ask you uh, about sort of the climate of the debate in Canada since the passage of the law. Has it has it changed? Is it still sort of a hot issue or is this this something that's is it different now? No, I think I mean, uh, there were more there was more debate uh, around the ethics of it. I think it's settled really quickly into the Canadian fabric as something that is considered part of the medical system now. My grandmother um, just passed away uh, a month ago, and I was amazed at how um, open the, the medical system was to talking about this. In the end, she did not have a medical assisted death, but she was looking into it. Um, you see it in the obits, um, not just in the obits, but in general profiles of people who died in the newspapers quite regularly now. There had been a lot of pushback from doctors, and there still is, um, uh, a court case going on in the province where I'm sitting in Ontario uh, around Christian doctors and dentists who don't want to be any part of this. But generally, you see um, that um, uh, that more and more doctors are supportive of, of it as something that should be available to patients, not that they necessarily want to be involved themselves. Um, I think it's sort of like gay marriage here, that there was a lot of fury and anger and debate before it passed and now it's it's become sort of an established part of the medical system in Canada and you know um, if anything there's more debate about its expansion um, as opposed to it being retracted altogether. Well Catherine Porter thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Thanks for having me nice to be here.
You're tuned into Global Journalist. Today's program is the second installment of our two-part series on euthanasia and end-of-life issues. We're focusing today on physician-assisted suicide in Canada and the U.S. To expand our discussion now, we're going to bring in two guests with differing perspectives on the issue. Joining us from Washington is Diane Rehm. For 37 years, she was the host of The Diane Rehm Show at WAMU in Washington, D.C., one of the most popular talk shows in the history of NPR. She now hosts the podcast On My Mind and is also an advocate for physician-assisted suicide or death with dignity, as its supporters often call it. Diane, welcome. Thank you. Also with us from Toronto is Maura McQueen. She's the executive director of the Canadian Catholic Bioethics Institute in Toronto. She's an opponent of physician-assisted suicide and has been critical of Canada's law. Maura, welcome. Thank you. Uh, well, if I could start with you, Diane Rehm, uh, you have been a longtime supporter uh, of Death with Dignity, as its supporters call it, um, and you've talked about how the death of your husband, John, several years ago reinforced your belief in this. How, how so? Well, my husband was suffering from Parkinson's disease. He had had it for about eight years. He was in a, a facility um, and he called together our son, our daughter, and the doctor and said to all of us, I can no longer use my hands. I can no longer stand. I can no longer feed myself. I can no longer toilet myself. I am ready to die. And I'd like to have your help, he said to the doctor. And at the time, he was in a facility in Maryland, which did not have medical aid in dying as those of us who support it wish to call it, rather than doctor-assisted suicide. My husband did not <clears throat> commit suicide. He relinquished his life because he no longer had any pleasure in his life. His mind was working just fine. The doctor told him he could not help him, but that the only thing that he, John Ring, could do was to stop eating, stop drinking water, and stop taking medications. He had already talked with me at length about this, and Indeed, the very next day, that mm -hmm. is what he did. And for 10 long days, I sat with him day and night as he slowly died. The expressions on his face indicated agony, but he never cried out. He never asked for water. He never asked for food. He was ready to let go. And on the 10th day, he died. It was awful. He should not have been subjected to that long, painful process. Uh, Maura McQueen, if I could bring you in here, uh, Diane describes a very <laughs> difficult death for her husband. Had he been in Canada in this current situation now, he would have had the option of, uh, of death with dignity, as Diane describes it. What, I mean, what's, your, what's your response? This actually sounds like kind of a classic case of someone who these laws are designed for. Uh, yes, you, you could say that, and, and I could talk, and I, you know, I have extreme sympathy for anybody who is in pain and anybody who's suffering. Of course, it's a very human response. And I could also, talk a bit more subjectively about people I know, one of my best friends who died beautifully. Uh, you know, she, her pain was controlled. She was in control. She, because of her many different stances, she, she would never have thought about physician-assisted suicide. And so that, then it becomes subjective. I think this way, somebody else thinks that way. My mother lived to be 100. 
Uh, she was compass mentis. Of course, she was frail, wasn't able to do many things towards the end of her life. But she and we considered hers a life well lived until she actually died of a very quick, sudden and merciful, you might say, heart attack. But my real concern is more from the point of view of your program, I think, which is about the law and public policy in Canada, about the actual legislation. Uh, the, Catherine did talk about the, the conditions, the criteria for the law here, and the way people are thinking perhaps it should in fact be expanded. I think she's right that in Canada, people are very liberal in the sense, I think, that they accept laws. Uh, in many cases, not without a lot of forethought, not a, not a, not with a lot of thought about what this might lead to, more about immediate situations. So we react through compassion, which compassion is not bad in itself. But of course, there's the whole question then of where do your choices through compassion, where do they actually lead to? So the expansion here in Canada is something that we, all be, I and many other people, including many physicians, have been very concerned about, that they said at the time that there would be criteria uh, you know, beyond which the, the law would not be applied. And so they're very, very strict at the minute about capacity, as Catherine said, the capacity to consent, the person himself or herself should be the person who does this. Now, the Canadian uh, Council of Academies came up with a report for the federal government suggesting that, it, that pe some people are talking about the law being expanded to minors, so mature minors, those under 16, or to people who are somehow incapacitated through some form of mental illness, which would include the dementias. And so there's a real concern here that if, if there's a move away from consent and capacity to consent, then I think we many of us would be very, very concerned about vulnerable people in the population. Well, I don't well if I could turn this back to Diane Reem, then yeah. I think Maura raises uh, some questions that um, are, are, are often asked about this issue, which is that if there is uh, medical assistance in dying or physician-assisted suicide, for people with terminal illnesses very near death, th there's a lot of support for that. But then once you open that door in the Netherlands and some other countries, you've seen that these laws have been extended to include other people and that there have been some other maybe unanticipated consequences. Well, I wish first to correct one thing you said, which is that there are actually seven states and the District of Columbia, including Montana, which was decided by a court ruling. I'm sorry, so that's there, that's correct. You're right. You're right. In the other states, there's yeah, been legislation that's gone through exactly. legislature. And in Washington state, there was a uh, referendum so that you have very different kinds of decisions being made. I also want to speak about pain because pain is totally subjective. And I'm glad to know for Mara's sake that her friend went through it and died peacefully. I have for the last year and a half been working on a documentary a film documentary titled When My Time Comes. And I'm also writing a companion book that goes along with that. So I've been traveling the country talking with patients, doctors, ethicists, everybody imaginable concerned with this and understanding that painkillers can go only so far. Palliative care can go only so far. And there is pain that breaks through. And people need to understand, especially doctors, mm -hmm. that it should be up to the patient to make that decision. What we're talking about here is choice. If you believe 
that God should be the only taker, the only decider of life. I fully support you. If, on the other hand, you want every kind of medical support available, I support you. And if you choose to make the decision to end your pain and suffering, I support you. It's choice. I should have that right, as I do here in Washington, D.C. I just testified for a joint committee of the Maryland House of Delegates, mm -hmm. who I pray will adopt well, medical Di aid in dying. Well, well, Diane, if I could if, let Ma uh, Maura McQueen respond, respond to that. Well, there's, there's several points, and especially about pain and the control of pain. I also work with uh, several palliative care physicians in hospitals, et cetera, and not and I'm, just I'm the sorry, one... Maura, if you could just give us a brief explanation of what palliative care involves for okay. those who may be unfamiliar. Oh, I'm, okay, for sure. So uh, patients are, themselves are deemed palliative or palliative care is asked for when it's clear that nothing else can be done to actually cure the illness that they have. And so for all of us, of course, unless we have a very sudden death, then we reach that stage. It's, if, if you like, it's the natural stage in, in just being human and the last, last stage before we die. And that palliative stage can last perhaps for quite some time. It just depends on the illness. It's highly variable. And the, the most of the statistics that come, and people can check this for themselves, from palliative uh, care specialists is that really 99% of pain can be controlled. I appreciate Diane's point. It's not just about, in fact, it goes in terms of what they call deep sedation, where the patient, as many people listening will know, the patient it receives sedation to the extent of unconsciousness if the pain is really if you like, intolerable, really difficult to bear. And Diane's right, it's highly subjective. There are people who can take it, there are people who can't. And it's not a moral judgment, it's a factual and physical judgment. And that particular uh, care, that deep sedation, the person is usually brought back to the surface every so often to see how she's doing, he's doing, uh, can he cope, can she cope, uh, try it out, etc. And it can go on like that. And our Catholic Church uh, accepts that as a way of handling the the most deep pain, the, the, the really severe pain. And because there isn't an attempt to kill the person, there is an attempt to end the person's life. The focus is always on helping the person to deal with that. And so for well, Maura, Diane, if I if I could, I mean, it seems like in practice, the issues aren't always so black and white in that in no. In, in many cases, doctors are removing life support, are giving medication that they know will almost certainly result in death. And how, how are we to distinguish that ethically from physician-assisted suicide? Okay. I mean, with, withdrawing re uh, support is a completely different thing from giving medication to end life. I'm not sure that you actually meant that second part yourself. Knowing that some kind of medication may in fact uh, lead to death is very, very different from saying that you're using it to cause death. Uh, I mean, there's a huge moral distinction there. And again, uh, the way we talk about it in, in clinical ethics situations in hospitals when we're advising families about what they can do at the end of life, we do talk about burdensomeness to the patient as one of the, the most significant factors in saying that a certain treatment should be stopped. It, it, we come to that conclusion if it's clear that the, the treatment, in fact, is no longer curative. I mean, it doesn't make sense to go on doing something that doesn't work. And at well, that I point... I'm that, sorry, Diane, sorry, if you the, want to jump in here on this point. Okay, okay. I'd like to jump in because I have seen individuals who are maintained in that unconscious state for too long. And it is so difficult for doctors and patients. And doctors have told me that what happens in the hospitals is that doctors deliberately 
when there is no hope of health. Again, two doctors will give more and more and more morphine. That's probably true, no, Diane. Knowing, <laughs> but it's knowing illegal. That, excuse me, knowing that the patient will die and that it happens all the time in the hospital. And the major distinction uh, here, too, is that the patient doesn't actually have a voice in this process, exactly. too, that this is a determination being exactly. made by the doctor or maybe by a family member. Exactly. And that's and I, do not, I do not wish to be kept alive. That's a different matter. Hospital. It's not about you. Excuse I mean, the law is not about individuals. Well, I'm sorry, Diane. Let's let's let different. Maura respond to that point real sure. quickly because I want to move on. The, the whole the whole question when questions get muddied up, it really really bothers me because it's not about these individual situations and how I feel. When the debate is framed around this question of choice, I mean, automatically it polarizes people. I'm for it. I'm against it. It leads nowhere. What I think we really have to do when we're talking about the law is to see what has the law done? What is the law doing? If, in fact, there are moves towards broadening the law, what would be the likely consequences? And it's those consequences that really bother me because, in fact, it's the element of choice then that becomes kind of a problem. Because if we're talking about somebody who does develop dementia, or if we talk about pe physicians making decisions for patients, which is absolutely wrong and Ill illegal and immoral, because it, especially in Canada, and I'm assuming in the United States, nobody is allowed to do any kind of medical procedure on me with my consent and that's exactly. partly why the law well, I, th I think diane's point is that there's there's a difference between what maybe the what letter the of the law says and what happens in practice but but i'm sorry okay. Maura, we're just running out of time i want to give the last word to okay. diane reen diane where do you see this issue moving uh in the united states in particular over the next three to five years frankly i think we're a long way from what mara outlines as the concerns about those who might make a decision should they develop Alzheimer's. I think the clear issue right now is that in 20 years of experience in Oregon, not one case of pushing a patient, not one, pay, uh, not one case of a doctor putting a patient's life at risk by suggesting this because individuals must make at least two requests and indeed have a psychiatric e evaluation. That's part of Maryland's new law. Well, we're out of time for this edition of Global Journalist. I'm, so, I'm sorry we had to stop there. Uh, but Global Journalist is a production of the Reynolds Journalism Institute at the Missouri School of Journalism and KBIA Mid-Missouri Public Radio. Many thanks to Catherine Porter, Maura McQueen, and Diane Rehm for joining us. Our assistant producers this week are Molly Jackson, Kyle Lehushik, and Francesca Stottlemyer. Rosie Belson is supervising producer. Grace Lett is visual editor. For all of us at Global Journalist, I'm Jason McClure. Thanks for tuning in.